Good morning, everyone. This is Steve Hobson, the editor of Motor Transport, and a very, very warm welcome to this uh, webinar on the Direct Vision Standard um, in association with Brigade Electronics. Um, I'd like to thank Brigade, first of all, for supporting us with this um, online event. And I'd also like to thank DAF Trucks and the FTA, who are also going to be taking part. Um, Transport from London were due to be presenting, but they're all um, rather busy at the moment, sort of making sure that people don't get onto tube trains too, uh, too many people on, and the buses social distancing. So unfortunately, they can't be with us. Um, they have sent over their presentation, which I will be showing you before we get into the other presentation. So unfortunately, they're not here to take questions, but we can see the thinking behind the introduction of DVS. Um, first of all, I've got to say is I've no idea where your toilets are, um, where your nearest fire exit is, or if you're planning to have a fire drill today. Um, and yeah, leave your mobile phones on because we can't hear you. That's fine. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask written questions throughout the webinar, um, which I will moderate and put to the panel at the end of the three presentations. Um, we'll, we'll do it that way rather than take questions individually. Um, the whole event is due to last about an hour, so get your cup of tea and a biscuit. Get sitting comfortably, and uh, also, if you really like it so much you want to watch it again, it's all being recorded and will be available on the MT website for about three months if you really want to see it again. Um, the reason we're all here today is uh, under the direct vision standard, about 250,000 trucks over 12 tonnes, which go into Greater London, are going to have to have a direct vision permit, um, stating that they either have the one-star direct vision rating or a compliance safe system which relies on cameras and sensors and, and failure to comply uh, could result in fines of £550 per day per vehicle. Um, now, I've just been asking Natalie at the FTA and we, we think there's about 25,000 permits that have been issued so far, so there's still a long way to go and I guess that's why there's so much interest in this topic today. Just to clarify the introduction date, as I say, I've got some slides from TFL to show you. In fact, let's, let's start that now, and that should give us a little bit um, of more background. As I say, these are the TFL slides. Now, um, the, the reason is that they were talking about introducing this is because, as we know, London has a particular problem with cyclists injuries and uh, a lot of those are involving with HGVs a and buses to be fair as well um, but obviously we're here to talk about HGVs today. Um, I'm not going to read all these slides out but as you can see the, the problem is that you know while HGVs make up a very small proportion of the road traffic they're involved in quite a lot of the cyclist and pedestrian fatalities. The numbers there go up to 2017 now it's a concern to me personally that we don't have a lot more up-to-date data because we've had clocks and we've had force for several years now and it, we, we don't seem to have much evidence if these schemes really work to reduce cyclist casualties. Uh, you know, I go into central London quite a lot before the lockdown and you know, in my view, the way cyclists, especially tourists on those um, hiding bikes behave, it's a miracle there aren't 10 killed per day, never mind 10 per year. Um, so uh, my view is that there's a, a very, there's a very strict limit on what you can do to the vehicle to make things safer while people insist on cutting up the insides of large vehicles um, on the near side when they're quite clearly indicating to turn left. It's, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. It doesn't matter how many cameras you've got, how many windows you've got, if cyclists insist on cutting up the inside of trucks at junctions. And I think if TfL was here, I'd ask them why they designed the cycle lanes so that they take cyclists up the near side um, at junctions when, you know, as a cyclist myself, I wouldn't dream of doing that. I'd be on the offside. But anyway, there we go. Uh, right, so let's just move down a bit. Um, so, yes, why direct vision? Um, there's, there's a lot of facts and figures, uh, you know, about why um, you should have better vision from trucks. And as I say, this, that, that's, that's fine. I've got no problem with that at all. I think it's, it's important. Um, but, you know, I do question, as I say, with fours and clocks, they've gone down one particular route. Um, you know, you don't have to have a lot of direct vision from the cab, but you can achieve a safe system with sensors and cameras. And it is a slight concern to my mind um, why we, we're going down this route. Now, the other slight element of confusion, which we're hoping TfL could clear up, is the implementing, implementation date. Um, it was due to start on the 26th of October this year, and you have to have at least one star or a safe system to come in. Now, if you look on the TFL um, slide here, it's now saying the implementation date is March 2021. Now, there is a bit of confusion about that. What, what happened was they said they would delay it for at least four months, 
which took the implementation date to the 26th of February 2021, which happens to be a Friday. Um, and then so by the Monday after that date, it's the 1st of March. So we're well working towards at the moment implementation date on the 1st of March. Um, but as I say, it's, um, it's one of those moot points where it might be delayed further. But at the moment, that's what we're aiming for. It will be, doesn't mean that the standard isn't coming into force in October. It is, but it won't be um, enforced. And that is a bit of a grey area as to what's going to happen between um, October and March if you're in London and you have an accident and you, you're not compliant, as I say. It's, uh, that's a bit of a grey area, which I, we could talk about later. Right, as I say, that's all from me. Um, I wanted to move quickly on to the presentations. Um, and the, the first one we've got is uh, Andrew Lawrence, uh, UK product support specialist at Brigade Electronics, who's going to explain in a bit more detail how operators con can comply with the standard. Thank you. Take it away, Andrew. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, the Direct Vision Standard. Uh, well, it's the first legislation of its kind in the UK. Uh, it's in other schemes uh, we're all familiar with, such as Fours and Clock, which have been voluntary. Although start date is October this year, as we've just mentioned, uh, it's now been, enforced has been delayed now until February 2021 or 1st of March. Uh, however, uh, again, Steve says it's unclear about the possible implications if involved in an incident during this period. There are also some concerns due to the public being asked to stay away from public transport and making their own way on foot or by bicycle. Uh, potentially increasing the number of VIUs around the Greater London area. All operators with vehicles over 12 tonnes and operating in the Greater London will need a permit. If your vehicle meets the minimum requirement of one star or above, you'll automatically be eligible for a permit, but you still need to apply. If your vehicle does not, you can apply once your vehicle conforms to the safe system specification. The safe system specification covers the installation of equipment to improve driver visibility, including camera and sensor systems, audible alarms, and class five and six mirrors. Once enforcement starts, penalties for non-conformance will be severe for both the operator and the driver alike. Uh, and all of this will be enforced by Transport for London using their automatic number plate recognition cameras. TfL will also have the ability to revoke or suspend granted permit if the vehicle is found not to conform. So how do I find my star rating? Okay, well, there's no published list uh, by vehicle type. So uh, one approach is to contact your vehicle manufacturer and provide them with a registration and VIN number. Uh, alternatively, you can visit the TFL website where there's a DVS checker available, or you can contact Brigade Electronics and use our free service. DVS uses specific terminology when describing requirements, as does FORS. Our experience suggests there is some confusion as to the use of shall, should, and may in their documentation. For clarification, shall indicates an element that is mandatory. Should indicates an element that is recommended good practice. And may indicates an element that is optional or an emerging practice. Safe system specifications for vehicles with zero star rating includes the installation of active and passive devices. As mentioned previously, these include proximity sensors and camera systems fitted to the near side of the vehicle and audible warning devices for the ins inside the cab and outside of the vehicle, as well as for visibility class five and six mirrors. It should also be noted that the installation of this equipment is also deemed good practice irrespective of a star rating. As everyone knows, uh, this legislation is about saving lives and not just for avoiding fines. It's important that the equipment you fit is fit for purpose 
and provides quality that ensures reliability and longevity. Brigade recognized this and used our application experience and strong engineering team to develop and test application-specific products with strict quality control throughout the production process. So, is your supplier involved in all aspects of the product development? Does your supplier provide equipment tested to comply with the most exacting standards? Does your supplier offer industry-leading warranties? A brigade, for our customers' peace of mind, we believe safety depends on reliable products, quality reliable products. We provide products that are only released if they meet exacting industry standards, and we provide industry-leading warranties. We use approved bodies for production management and approvals, and approved testing houses to provide a full complement of testing, allowing Brigade to supply compliant equipment across the globe. As a global company, we're committed to working on similar requirements in other countries and bodies, including the German Ministry of Transport, Voluntary Regulations, and with the UN on their blind spot information system, which will form a mandatory requirement from 2024. Investing in good quality equipment is only worth doing if it is being installed correctly. Brigade have developed a network of approved and trusted fitters to ensure correct installation. We have noted that there's been a lot of confusion and misinformation spread regarding star ratings and requirements, such as, does installation of a safety system help me achieve three stars? Well, no. You cannot change the star rating after a vehicle's been manufactured. Or, I have an adequate star rating, so I don't need to apply. That's also false. You need to apply irrespective of your star rating. Sensors need to be fitted to the trailer. This isn't true. Uh, you may see that a DVS kit is TFL approved, but TFL does not endorse and approve any brand. Right, following this, uh, we've got a very short video, if I can just work out, uh, for you to see, which is uh, covering the safe system installation and process for obtaining a permit. Oh, you're right. It's uh, Ed from Maxi. Ah, nice to meet you. Hello, Mark. Your engineer for the day. Oh, fantastic. Here's have the uh, camera kit fitted. Ah, perfect. Yeah, nice one. Right, Ed. What we're what we're about to do today is we're going to put a, a scan system down the side of the vehicle. Okay. That's going to give you an audible warning in the truck when there's uh, anybody in close proximity, like cyclists, pedestrians, that kind of thing. We're also going to be putting a camera on this side. That's going to give you a full vision down this side um, on a screen inside the cab. Mm -hmm. That's all activated by when you indicate left automatically, nothing for you to oh, do there whatsoever. That good. Once we've done this job, that's going to make this truck compliant with the new vision standards, which is um, coming into force on the 26th of October of this year. Um, you will need to upload two photographs to the TFL website um, that allow you to apply for a permit for that. So that should um, you know, prevent you getting a hefty fines and so on yeah, and so no, forth. No, that's, that's, um, that's good. There'll also be a sticker goes on the back there. That'll uh, just to warn the pedestrians that this is a blind spot for you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, how long is this whole process going to take then? It takes me about five hours. Fantastic. Um, once we're done with the drone and I'm happy with the install, I'll give you a ring, come in, we'll discuss it, we'll go through so, the system. I'll, uh, I'll give you the keys and I'll, I'll see you later. Lovely. Cheers, mate. Good. Cheers, that, mate. So I'm just getting the size can system for the vehicle. The size can system on this vehicle should cover at least six metres down the side of the vehicle with a final sensor within one metre from the rear. So I'm now fitting the vehicle audible warning device to warn vulnerable road users that the vehicle is turning left. This is a combination of white sound and real speech. You will hear caution, the vehicle is turning left. So I'm just installing a camera here to the front and near side of the vehicle. This is to give a vid in cab visual aid for the driver or vulnerable road users such as cyclists down the near side of the vehicle. So I've just fitted the side scan warning buzzer to the near side over there. That will give the driver an audible sound uh, when he turns left, indicating that there's a hazard on his near side. Right, this is the seven inch LCD monitor, giving the driver a crisp view of the left hand side. Now this monitor will automatically activate when the driver indicates left. 
So finally, this is a vulnerable user blind spot warning sticker that is mandatory to apply and obtain a permit. Hi, Ed. Hi, Mark. How are you good doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. How's tricks? Yeah, very good. Trucks all ready. Um, yep. Just to talk you through it quickly, we've got the side scan along the side, spread out down the side of the vehicle channel there. There's a speaker under here, which is hidden, hidden way out of the rain. Yep. And then we go to the front, nice visual camera on the side here. Gives you a real lovely view down the side. So if you want to just jump in the driver's seat, yeah, then we'll sure. um, just talk you through well, the right. internals. Right then, Ed. So on the, uh, the first thing we'll go through is the left-hand side, over on the far left here, you'll see a little speaker there. Okay, yeah. That's your side scan warning buzzer. Yep. That warns you of runnable road users on your left-hand side. Mm -hmm. That will give you an audible beep. you then got your 7-inch LCD monitor there, gives you a nice crisp view of your left-hand side. Mm -hmm. Both of these systems will activate automatically when you indicate left. So you ah, don't, okay. don't need to worry about anything. It's all automatic. Good. If you're happy with that, um, where you need to go from here is don't forget to upload your pictures to okay, yeah, our yeah. website to apply for your permit. Oh, right, there's your keys, Ed. Cheers, Mark. Uh, I'm going to need this to into the rest of the vehicles in my fleet before the 26th of October. Do you do it to any other vehicles other than DAF? Well, absolutely, Ed. Yeah. We can retrofit the DVS kit to any manufacturer. No problem at all. Just arrange it through the DAF network system. No problem at all. Okay, fantastic, Mark. Thank you very much for your work. Okay, thank you. That's all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. That was uh, most instructive, and uh, thanks for that video. It uh, was very, very interesting to see how it all works. Um, right, we're going to move swiftly on to um, James Turner, Product Marketing Manager at DAF Trucks, who's going to explain a bit more about how DAF will be uh, complying with the standard uh, from the factory gate. Um, over to you, James. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is James Turner, Product Marketing Manager for uh, DAF Trucks. Uh, we are a subsidiary of uh, Packard, one of the world's largest truck manufacturers. Uh, had a market share of 30.5% in the UK in 2019, uh, which makes us the UK market leader uh, for trucks above six tonnes for the 25th uh, consecutive year. Uh, we have a dealer network of over 134 locations, and the full range of DAF vehicles are actually built in the UK in uh, Leyland, Lancashire, uh, last year producing over 19,500 vehicles. Uh, so you could say that actually with that market share, one in three trucks last year uh, was a British built vehicle, uh, which is uh, certainly a brilliant thing for, for the UK economy. So in this uh, presentation, I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, the direct vision standard, namely the HGV safety permit scheme and what uh, DAF trucks, uh, our strategy is in order to ensure vehicles compliant uh, for, for your vehicles and fleets. So London uh, has led the way really when it comes to uh, vehicle safety. Uh, 2015 was the introduction of the safer lorry scheme. Uh, whereby vehicles over three and a half tons were required to be fitted with mirrors and side guards. As well in 2015, the clock system, uh, construction logistics and community safety, which uh, was the first step to uh, ensure that vehicles uh, were fitted with safe systems, as well as the clients in which those uh, haulage operators were working with uh, to ensure uh, maximum road safety, so traffic routing, um, site suitability and access, etc. Uh, as well as then Ford in 2016, um, whereby you know things like driver training were in, uh, introduced and certain levels of accreditation were required in order to become part of that scheme. And 2020 is the introduction of the direct vision standard. Uh, so Transport for London uh, drafted the Loughborough Design School to understand how much direct vision was available to a driver from the driving position um, for a whole uh, raft of manufacturers and you can see in the bottom right hand uh, image here uh, zero stars to five stars based on uh, what direct vision is possible it's been mentioned before that the 26th of october this year we'll see vehicles entering london required to have one star or at least a safe system fitted in order to operate within that area of Greater London. Looking forward, 2024, we'll see uh, an upgrade to three stars uh, in order to enter that, that area, or indeed a progressive safe system fitted to the truck. It's 
worth noting that, uh, yes, the scheme does go live on the 26th of October 2020. So it's really important for operators to ensure that those vehicles are compliant if entering that uh, that area from, from that date. And in order to apply for a permit, you can actually apply for one now. Um, it's worth noting that enforcement has been delayed until the end of February, but the scheme still does go live in October. Um, so just to kind of reiterate, you need to have one star minimum or at least a safe system fitted. There is an update in October, as I previously mentioned, uh, of three stars being required or at least a progressive safe system fitted. And there is a review and consultation planned in 2022 of exactly what is included within that progressive safe system. Uh, there's uh, a little bit of uncertainty as to what is going to be included within that, but it's worth noting that any, you know, with regards to that progressive safe system, um, it will be any new equipment or technology proposed for the system must be retrofittable, industry recognised and readily available on the market at the time. So it's not going to be uh, something that's, uh, you know, impossible. It's very much like what we expect uh, that will be available today for vehicles that don't meet the one star requirements. So that safety permit scheme then, it operates within the Greater London area, which is the current low emission zone. It will be operational 24 hours a day, every day of the year, uh, and you will need the permit to enter. There's no charge to apply for the safety permit. Uh, of course, so for those vehicles above 12 tonnes gross vehicle weight, uh, it's important to apply for a permit uh, on the TFL website. Failure to have a permit operating within this zone could result in a penalty charge notice of £550, reduced uh, to half if paid within 14 days. So what is a safe system? What is actually included within that safe system? Uh, if uh, you don't meet one star, what must you have fitted? Well, first and foremost, a class five mirror curb view close proximity uh, mirror must be fitted, as well as a class six mirror, as well as side underrun protection, so side guards to the to the vehicle as well. It's important to note tractor units are exempt from that, so it's only really rigid vehicles that uh, are concerned when it comes to uh, side lateral protection. Uh, external pictorial uh, stickers on the rear of the vehicle, much like the one in the top right hand corner, so the blind spot take care. A sensor system that alerts the driver to the presence of a vulnerable road user should also be fitted to the near side of the vehicle. An audible vehicle manoeuvring warning, this vehicle is turning left, shall be fitted to warn vulnerable road users when the vehicle is turning left and also a fully operational camera monitoring system shall be fitted to the near side of the vehicle. Now, there is a very helpful document on the TFR website which gives a lot of detail when it comes to those camera systems, sensors, the audible warning, uh, what must be fitted, and this is just a, a short excerpt from that document. So the camera monitoring system should aim to completely eliminate or minimise the remaining vehicle blind spot at the near side as far as practically possible. Um, we've seen the most common place for that camera to be fitted is on the sort of near side wind deflector offering uh, maximum um, visibility down the near side of the truck. It's recommended that sensors on rigid vehicles and articulated tractor units have coverage of six metres down the near side or one metre from the rear of the vehicle for a tractor unit, whichever is smaller. And as well, some detail there on the audible warning system, uh, which should be fitted, which includes some decibel reading recommendations. It's important to also understand that the device should have a manual uh, override facility between the hours of uh, half past 11 and 7 o'clock in the morning. So how do you apply for a permit? Well, again, uh, as uh, Andrew mentioned, even if you have a vehicle uh, with one star, two star uh, or, or further uh, or zero star, you need to apply for a permit. And this can be done on the TFL website simply by entering the vehicle registration number. Um, so any vehicle over 12 tonnes entering that area will need this permit. 
So for vehicles that have a uh, star rating, one star or above, the permit will be granted. But for zero star vehicles, you will need to demonstrate the installation of this safe system. And so an example here of the two clear pitches, which must be attached to the application, uh, which demonstrates that the vehicle applies for the permit. So this picture here of one of our CF uh, PIPA demonstrators, we've uploaded two clear pitches to show the mirrors are fitted, as well as the side guards, the near side camera and the sensor system, as well as the uh, rear pictorial uh, warning signage. So how does DAF uh, comply with regards to the DAF uh, sorry, the dark vision standard star rating. Well, for LS vehicles, uh, for 14 to 16 tonnes, most vehicles will have two stars, at least one star as a minimum. And for our 18 tonne vehicles, again, at least one star, but it can be upgraded to two star if the passenger door window is specified during new vehicle specification. So on our LS models, we do have a factory fitted option for uh, a, a uh, passenger door fitted window, which I can go into a little bit more detail in a moment. Uh, for CF and XS vehicles, a safe system is actually required. So what we've done, uh, we've actually managed to ensure that the main hardware requirements for the safe system uh, can be fitted from new vehicles at our factory in Leyland. So uh, a in-cab monitor, near-side uh, mounted camera, as well as the ultrasonic sensors and audible left-turn warning can be fitted on new vehicles at the factory. And the main advantage of this is that it will come with the vehicle type approval and, of course, the factory-fitted two-year warranty, which is a real advantage uh, for when you need to register the vehicle, as well as uh, operational confidence. We can even offer a rear view camera as an option. And for those operators wishing for, for the gold standard, again, it's not part of the safe system requirements, but we understand that operators want to uh, ensure, you know, for, for their own operational uh, requirements or insurance purposes, we can offer the facility to install uh, data recorders of those cameras. We can offer uh, forward-facing cameras, driver side cameras, even cameras mounted to the load space uh, area, uh, as well as reverse uh, rear ultrasonic sensors. The recorder options, we can offer a four channel, an eight channel. So there really is a, a wide spectrum of options available to operators, not only wishing to meet the, the, the safe system permit requirements, but also to their own uh, individual specification requirements as well. I mentioned previously as well, so the LF is, is available with the vision door. So uh, in certain instances, it will upgrade the star rating from one to two, uh, but really it offers you know, much more direct vision to the driver in, in that near side uh, blind spot area. The other advantage of course, is that we can actually open the window uh, in, a, in a, a horizontal fashion rather than a vertical drop, which is great for when reversing, to, uh, to hear sounds that are going on around the vehicle in a, in a maneuvering situation or, or just demisting or for, uh, for interior climate comfort really. So uh, a really excellent added value uh, option there for, for LS vehicles. Looking forward then, uh, from the direct vision standard, there are uh, other areas regarding uh, vehicle safety. Um, so the general safety regulation has recently been announced, which means that there will be new safety systems required for heavy vehicles from certain uh, levels. So from 2022 for new type approvals, uh, there will be things like uh, vulnerable road detection, front side and rear driver drowsiness detection, um, tire pressure monitoring, for example, and for uh, all registrations from 2024, they, those systems will also be required. From uh, July 2024 for new type approvals, uh, driver distraction recognition will be required and for 2026 for all vehicle registrations. And indeed for 2026 new type approvals will require new standards 
uh, related to direct vision. So it's interesting to note that London really is leading the way in terms of direct vision and it's actually being recognised on a much larger stage uh, and being taken into account for, for new vehicles, new target approvals from 2026 and all registrations from 2029. So yeah, a bit of a whistle stop tour when it comes to uh, direct vision, uh, the direct vision standard, but I hope that uh, this short presentation has at least uh, installed some confidence that the DAF vehicle range in its current form can indeed uh, supply you with a vehicle that can enter London. Um, we're prepared uh, for those 2022 consultations when it comes to uh, the next stage of the direct vision standard. Um, and we're fully in support of the brigade equipment for vehicles that require retrofit as well. So any DAF dealer will be able to supply you with a kit to retrofit this uh, equipment that is suitable for the safe system permit for those vehicles that don't meet the one star requirement. Thank you very much for your attention. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, James. That's very, very interesting. Some interesting technical details there and how you go about fitting between the, uh, the cameras and sensors. Um, right, our, our next and final speaker is uh, Natalie Chapman, Head of Urban Policy at the FTA, who's going to go into some of the more policy uh, issues surrounding DVS rather than some of the technical stuff. Um, over to you, Natalie. Great, thanks for that, Steve. Um, well, James and Andrew have covered uh, a lot of the details of the scheme, how to comply, how to obtain your permit, and of course the enforcement process. So I'm not going to go over all of that again. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the work that FTA has been doing on this, um, our views of the scheme, um, and what we believe the next steps um, should be. So um, um, I have also borrowed a few uh, slides from TfL as well, with their permission, I, I add. So uh, this first one, I think Steve uh, covered at the very beginning. And it's really to reiterate that there is um, a national issue with HGV and vulnerable road user collisions, but London has a particularly bad problem. And that's due to the high levels of walking and cycling, dense infrastructure, and increasing freight activity, particularly um, the construction work that's going on in, in London. Um, so we therefore don't see as yet any other cities introducing this, um, but of course with an increased focus on supporting active travel, um, walking and cycling, and um, particularly people are encouraged to get, uh, encouraged now to avoid public transport to enable social distancing, um, we could potentially start to see calls elsewhere. So we haven't seen anything as yet, but we are going to keep a very close eye on the situation. So to address the problem in London, um, the CLOCKS programme was developed um, specifically for the construction sector. Um, there were three work streams, one of which was specifically around vehicle design. And that work stream developed into the wider Safer Trucks programme at TfL. Um, and then through this work, um, TfL initially engaged with TRL and later with Loughborough Design School to develop uh, the direct vision standard. And um, the Mayor of London has committed to using DVS as part of his wider Vision Zero commitment to eliminate deaths and serious injuries on London's roads by 2041. Now, FTA's view is that we absolutely support the Mayor of London's ambition for uh, zero vehicular harm. Clearly, it's not acceptable for anyone to die or be seriously injured on our roads. Um, we can't have any target other than zero, and that's absolutely what we have to aim for. With all of these things, the question is always, well, what is the best way to do this? Um, and uh, FTA is opposed in principle to vehicle design being set at a local level. Really, as a minimum, this is the role of national government and should ideally be set by UN or European level bodies. The creation of a direct vision standard will create a niche market for manufacturers um, and has the potential to increase the price of, of trucks um, in London. So instead, we believe that the, the new vehicle design standards and autonomous safety features, which will reduce human error, will be the most effective way of doing this. And James, in his presentation, talked about how this will be included in new type approvals from, uh, from 2022 and, of course, from new vehicle registrations from, from 2024. So um, whilst, uh, whilst FTA doesn't agree that DVS is the best way forward, um, I have to say that through the development of the scheme, TFL have actually been good at engaging with us, taking on board um, many of our recommendations. Um, so one example of that uh, was driver training, which was originally due to be included uh, as part of the safe system. 
Now, driver training is obviously a good thing to do and something that we support in principle. And we know that uh, a lot of good operators are, are, are ensuring that their drivers have some kind of training on, on vulnerable roads to user safety. Um, but to include a driver element in what is essentially a vehicle standard would have just overcomplicated things. And TfL actually said that it was unenforceable. Um, and our position is in any regulation, you know, even if we don't like the regulation, it must be enforceable. Otherwise, you create an unlevel playing field with, you know, good compliant operators at one end and that those that won't bother if they think they can get away with it at the other. So we need to make sure that we are, you know, offering that, that level playing field for everyone. So instead, as, as FGA suggested, TfL will now signpost driver training on the DVS webpage and on the permit application portal. So there are good training courses out there and they will just highlight where they are, but it won't be part of the standard, which is good. Um, and TfL, uh, sorry, DVS has also uh, been developed and refined in partnership with um, an expert panel of researchers, um, academics, HGV manufacturers, uh, freight industry reps, including ourselves, um, and regulatory bodies. So we have, uh, it's had kind of quite a wide range of input into that, which has helped uh, help shape um, uh, the, the scheme that we are now starting to see come forward. Um, and we also know that TfL have engaged with um, the UNECE, the European Commission, and the United Nations um, Economic Commission for Europe, because their ultimate aim is to get direct vision increased in new cab design, um, which kind of is the right approach. That's along with you know, the auto Horizon Autonomous Features as well. Um, and as we heard in James's presentation, um, that will come into effect for new vehicle type approvals from January 2026 and new registrations from 2029. Um, but the pressure is on the Mayor of London to do something sooner, and basically he just didn't want to wait that long, which is why we are seeing the scheme coming forward that we are. So in terms of the, the, the timeline, well, the permit application process is open now. It opened in October last year, a year before the scheme was originally due to go live on the 26th of October this year. Um, however, then, of course, something called COVID-19 came along and kind of upset all of our best laid plans. Um, and as we know, it's caused massive disruption to the industry. Um, and while some companies, particularly those involved in food retail, have seen a huge increase in workload, um, others, such as those supplying the hospitality and event sectors, um, have seen a massive downturn in business. And there were also initial issues with supplying the urgent and changing needs of London and the rest of the UK, whilst, of course, the industry itself coping with the increasing disruption to operations through sickness and self-isolation. And as well as the administrative and operational difficulties that the industry has been experiencing, we we're also concerned about the disruption to supplies of trucks um, and equipment. So we wrote to the Mayor of London calling for DVS and the tightening of the London-wide uh, low emission zone, which is also due to take, was also due to take effect on the same day. Uh, we asked for both of those uh, schemes to be delayed. We asked for a delay for a year um, to coincide with the expansion of the ULES in October 2021. Um, we've got to, uh, at least till the end of, of February, um, and we think we are likely to need longer than that. So we will continue to work uh, with TfL on the, the detail and the timetable for this. So obviously not, uh, enforcement is not starting on the 26th of October, and that was confirmed uh, by the mayor um, last month. Um, and um, it will be delayed until at least uh, the end of February. Um, and the new start date for, uh, uh, sorry, uh, TfL will confirm the new uh, start date for enforcement in September. So it's gonna be at least the 1st of March, as we heard earlier from Steve, but it could be longer than that. Um, but it's, it's certainly not going to be before. And we will continue to work with TfL to get maximum flexibility for operators. There's likely to have been a considerable change to the economic impact assessment. You know, the shape of the economy, as well as the situation that many businesses will find themselves in will look massively different to the time when this scheme was originally drawn up. Um, 
We also need to understand the situation around vehicle and equipment supply issues and also access to credit because many businesses are going to have a much worse credit rating after the crisis than they did before. Um, so sort of separately as part of our COVID-19 work, we are asking government to give consideration to support surviving businesses with, with a credit guarantee scheme so they can expand again and, and re help rebuild the economy. Um, but whilst enforcement is delayed, the scheme, um, as we heard, will still officially start on the 26th of October this year. Um, and that's because delaying the scheme, um, CFL have told us, would require additional public consultation. It would have to go back on the traffic regulation order and go out for public consultation. So we appreciate the rationale for that decision, um, but it does pose a potential risk of legal liability for operators. So, for example, if you um, have a zero-star rated vehicle without the safe system fitted and it was to be involved in a road traffic collision after the start date of the scheme, whether DVS is being enforced or not, it could be a potential area of negligence or breach that the courts may pursue when they're considering the extent of damages. It wouldn't necessarily be seen as the fault or the main cause of a collision, but it could be something that's, that's that say uh, increases um, damages awarded. Um, so we have written to TfL um, seeking a delay to the start date of the entire scheme, not just of enforcement. Um, they have confirmed that they have no plans to do that and go back out public consultation. So what we are asking for is, is at the very least, then a clearer formal public statement that TfL does not expect the industry to comply with the scheme during this non-enforcement period. So it's really, I guess, for operators, um, you know, a question of balance of what you decide to do. And I think if you if you have plans in place and you clearly have a program to uh, to fit equipment to your vehicles or to procure uh, trucks that meet at least a one star rating, then you know that would be something that you could use in the unfortunate instant that you end end up in court. Um, so we will continue to kind of watch this closely and just try and get um, as clear a statement as we can for operators. Um, but we know that even with, um, you know, with, with the whole, you know, the, the issues that we've had as an industry of COVID-19, um, the operators have still been continuing to apply for permits, fit the safe system, procure vehicles where they can. Um, and TFL, uh, I think I said that they've, they've just been on just under 25,000 permits have been issued um, and that's based on and there's an estimate of about 250,000 HGVs that, that go into London each year so we're about 10% mark so clearly a long way to go but we we've got a little while yet so um, so we you know clearly as an industry you know things are still progressing even with these difficult times that we're currently going through and um, now beyond this of course um, in, uh, the scheme is going to be tightened in 2024, and ahead of that, TFL is committed to consult on the progressive safe system. So in 2024, it will be a minimum of three stars or the progressive safe system. We don't know yet what that may include. It's possible that no substantive um, new equipment comes available, and the decision is just to fit the safe system requirements to one and two star rated vehicles as well as zero. That is a possibility. Um, and TfL have said, <clears throat> have also committed that um, they will confirm either way, <clears throat> excuse me, the details of the progressive safe system um, in 2023, a year before um, the scheme is tightened. Um, appreciate this doesn't give a huge amount of time for operators to prepare, especially if they want to spec equipment on new vehicles rather than retrofit. But any requirements we have been told will be retrofitable. Um, and then uh, the tightening of the scheme um, is then due to take place in 2024. So that's um, that's my general update there, and I think that's sort of the end of the presentation. So I will uh, hand back to Steve to pick up any questions that we have been coming through. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Eva Janine. That's why I think that's answered quite a few questions which have been coming in. Actually, a lot of people. Uh, we're wondering if they get a, a safe system and a permit for the one-star requirement, what's going to happen um, in 2024 when they have to go to three stars? And I think the answer to that is uh, we don't really know yet, um, but we've got a bit of time to work on that one. Um, there is one particular question which I'd like to address to uh, Andrew and then uh, next to James, if that's all right. Um, an operator who runs some UK registered left-hand drive trucks, um, how do they go about getting the, the permit, can you fit the cameras, do they need cameras because the driver's on the left, 
And does uh, the scheme apply to foreign registered vehicles entering London, or will they be able to get away with it? Well, well uh, to be fair, uh, I'm not entirely sure exactly how it's going to work for those uh, foreign operators. Uh, strictly speaking, they should be uh, fined in any other uh, way as anyone else. Uh, in terms of left-hand drive vehicles in the UK, um, you still need to go through the process to determine whether the uh, the equipment's been uh, the vehicle has got a star rating. It still may have a star rating. Um, in actual fact, for the UK, it might impact. Uh, that'll be something actually be worth uh, checking up on with the pass with the driver being over that particular curb and vision is improved. Um, I'm afraid I can't answer uh, particularly clearly on that one, Dave. Sorry. James? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, our, our factory in uh, Eindhoven, um, obviously the, the markets that are not, are not right-hand drive vehicles, that we have released uh, a sales engineering information uh, bulletin for left-hand drive vehicles. Um, yeah, I mean, non-UK vehicles do have to conform as well. So uh, if, if, if it's a foreign registered vehicle, you still need to have a permit. Um, I imagine that if you were to enter uh, a vehicle registration uh, mark which you know wasn't recognised by TfL, you would get this the standard uh, message to say contact your vehicle manufacturer to understand what your star rating is. Um, but yeah, you still need to have a permit if you're a foreign registered vehicle, if you're a left-hand drive vehicle, um, and you know the requirements for a left-hand drive vehicle are pretty much a mirror of what's required for a, for a right-hand drive vehicle, if that makes sense. So just to be clear, a left-hand drive vehicle uh, safe system requirement will be, you know, class five and class six mirror fitted, the side under run protection, pictorial stickers on the rear of the vehicle, but actually um, a co-driver side blind spot camera and co-driver side ultrasonic side scan system, as well as a right turn audible warning. Okay, that's great. Um, there's one question that's been answered, I think, uh, do you need sensors and cameras on a trailer for an articulated vehicle? I think we've decided we don't. Uh, there is one interesting question. Uh, if you're fitting the equipment to um, a tractor unit, does the sticker have to go on the back of the tractor unit or on the back of the trailer? And bear in mind, you can swap trailers. How would that work in practice? And again, I don't know if James, if you want to uh, have a think about that one. Um, as far as I'm aware, the the, the left turn warning only needs to be fitted to the tractor unit. It's to cover that first six metres. Yeah. Down the cab. So fitting on the tractor unit will co easily comply. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I know, Daph, you don't do this, um, but one of the question is, does the mirror cam, which is fitted to a rival uh, Arctic, uh, count as direct vision? Do you know that, the answer to that one, James? I've I've heard uh, conversations, but I don't know for sure. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be able to answer that, I'm afraid, simply because we don't have that facility on our on our product range currently. Um, I mean, in pra in practice, logically, it does sound like it it could, but um, because it you know does the same thing as a near side blind spot camera, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, if, well, if, I well, jump, if I can jump in there, Steve, my un my understanding because I have had seen this question arise before. So if if uh, mirror cams are approved as mirrors under construction in use, then then they are fine. Then they class as mirrors under this. Um, under the safe system, so TFL would would class them as mirrors. Interesting. Uh, sorry, another couple for you here, James. Um, do you think that the fact that it's a 12 ton limit uh, on this will mean a lot of people will be buying vehicles just under the 12 ton uh, GVW limit? And uh, also, are you, is DAF going to develop, you know, a low entry type cab which some of the other manufacturers have come up with, or do you think? that you can uh, use conventional style uh, construction caps um, to meet the regulations as far as we know? Um, well, you know, our seven and a half tonner um, is a very popular model. Um, and, you know, we're not sort of seeing uh, any reduction in sales of that particular particular model. So it does offer a, 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 a solution, even though, of course, the, the seven and a half tonner will meet one star anyway. So you know, uh, it's possible that people will move to that area. But, uh, you know, I'm confident to say that whatever the gross vehicle weight 
that an operator chooses to to use, we have we have solutions available to meet the requirements um, currently. So whether that be uh, you know one or two stars on an LF or a safe system on a, a CF or XF, it's still possible to to operate within the, within that area. Um, and was your question sorry about future vehicles? Uh, yeah, as I say, whether people were picking up uh, under 12 ton and also whether you were planning to introduce, you know, a low entry type cab, which some of the other manufacturers have gone down to get away from the need for cameras and sensors. Um, yeah, so with regards to the recent uh, update uh, with, with the masses and dimensions uh, legislation um, that the European Commission announced to allow longer vehicles, more aerodynamic vehicles, there's certainly an opportunity for manufacturers to uh, work towards uh, cabs that offer greater direct vision. And it's something that we are um, working on at the moment to, to understand the benefits. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that we, we hope in the future we can, uh, you know, offer the marketplace uh, going forward. But currently, you know, our CF uh, FAD construction um, we can offer the, the the safety system from factory to make sure that uh, you can uh, you can obtain a permit. Yes, great. Okay, uh, Natalie, there's one perhaps here that you might be interested in talking about. We, we just we mentioned earlier on uh, clocks and fours have already introduced quite a bit of what's required for DVS. If you have a fours, bronze, silver, or gold fleet, does at what level would you automatically be compliant with DVS, or is do none of the fours levels actually mean you automatically get a safe permit? So, uh, sadly, you don't automatically get a safe permit for being any level of fours. Um, the safe system requirements have to be modelled on uh, for silver um, and gold requirements. So, if you have already got the equipment fitted um, to meet those requirements, then you're, you're probably fine with the safe system, but you will still, unfortunately, at the moment, need to go through the permit application process, submit uh, the, the evidence, the photos uh, that are required. Um, I have been talking to TfL about surely they can uh, you know, link up with the FALS database um, so that those FALS operators can have you know, an easier route through, um, bearing in mind they would have already had an audit as well. So they don't then have to go through the administration process a second time. Of course, we're very clear from the beginning, we did not want FALS to become a requirement of DVS, but if you are an operator who already has been through the hurdles of FALS, then it would make life a lot easier if TfL could just link to the FALS database and recognise that. But at the moment, unfortunately, you'd still need to go through the process. Um, it was interesting to see the slide on the near side uh, door window there, uh, James. Just fitting that alone, though, just to be clear, won't give you a star rating, will it? So you could argue, bearing in mind that the, the risks of security and water ingress, um, if you don't get one star just for fitting the door window and you've still got to fit the cameras and sensors, what is the benefit of the door window, in your opinion? So uh, Transport for London has... Uh, stipulated that a passenger door window will only add value to the star rating if it is OEM approved. So uh, the reason for that is because OEMs have the, the CAD data for the field of view of that particular window. So retrofitting of um, you know aftermarket windows indoors doesn't actually uh, upgrade uh, upgrade the star rating. Um, We've seen on our on our LF models, I mentioned we can fit the passenger uh, door window to those models. Uh, and the advantage, of course, is that it's included within the vehicle warranty. Um, it does offer direct vision, and you can operate the window in in, in you know open and close it. The issues that we have seen with the aftermarket systems is they do offer direct vision. Um, unfortunately, it's not included within um, TfL's safe system requirements uh, but there is concerns over cab security um, and possible uh, moisture ingress and things like that so yeah uh, it's frustrating that uh, the aftermarket systems aren't included within the safe system requirements because we've seen a lot of operators invest a lot of uh, you know time and money in fitting those systems uh, but you know, even though they don't comply, you know, we recognise as a manufacturer that they do offer the driver vision benefits, um, and you know, it is a good a good option for for operators to do so. Yeah, that's great. I mean, 
mean, just an observation here, really, rather than a question. There is a lot of concern that London in particular likes to introduce lots of different requirements, and it's getting very expensive for operators and OEMs to develop trucks, the London truck, as it were. Um, do we expect that you know London is just a he slightly ahead of the curve here and that the, the DVS will be rolled out across the UK and internationally, and it's a good investment, really, for everyone to get up to the standard, you know, just... Well, just because you run into London doesn't mean to say that you won't be required to fit this sort of kit um, in the future. I don't, Natalie, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, we, we're going to see more and more requirements sort of coming through. We, we, what we've been asking for is for a clear roadmap of what is being required of operators. Um, it, it feels like every time we get a change in um, uh, a change in mayor, um, that you know something else comes along and. and you know, the, the goalposts kind of shift again. Um, so we, what we need is just some kind of certainty for the future. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a sense, Natalie, whether this uh, requirement will come down below 12 tonne? I mean, we mentioned the popularity of the 7.5 tonne for urban deliveries. Um, you know, how reassured are you that this won't be spread further down the vehicle size limits? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess we can put no guarantees on that. There, there was a rationale by TfL for setting it at vehicles over 12 tonnes. So to be clear, if you are at 12 tonnes, um, you're not included as vehicles over 12 tonnes. Um, so the rationale was those were the vehicles that were involved in the highest proportion of, of uh, KSIs, killed and seriously injured uh, incidents with vulnerable road users. So there was, that was why the decision was made to set it at uh, vehicles over 12 tonnes. Um, and uh, again, sorry, this is one point one again for you, Natalie. I think I know the answer to this. One of the contract hire companies is asking, will there be any short-term derogations for rented vehicles um, for less than 28 days that they can go in without a safe permit? I'm, I'm guessing the answer to that's going to be no. Uh, no, no, not as far as I'm aware. No, <laughs> I'm afraid. Okay. There's a very, there's a very. Um, I mean, it, it applies to all, all vehicles over 12 tonnes. There is there is a uh, a very um, strict list of vehicles that are exempt, and there's a very strict list of um, exemptions from, say, particular elements of the safe system. So where it's either illegal or or impossible to fit certain bits of kit. Um, and what I would advise is that um, everybody goes and has a look on the TFL website. If you if you just Google a uh, T, uh, DVS and TFL, make sure you click on the TFL ones, there's all sorts of other web pages out there, and on there there's um, there's a guidance document which details everything about how to fit the safe system, um, there's also details on, on, on exemptions and, and sort of where bits need to be fitted, I know there was one question about um, stickers and where, what, what we need to do with articulated vehicles, and on page 23 of the guidance actually it says that all trailers used with the tractor unit will be required to fit warning signage. So the tractor unit doesn't have to have the sticker fitted, but the trailers do. So if you have got trailers that you're sending into London, um, then fit them all up with the stickers. Stickers are probably the cheapest bit of the kit that we need to fit on all of this. Yes, yes, of course. Um, uh, a question for you, um, Andrew, if you don't mind. And this yep. is asking about ultrasonic sensors, and do they not give a lot of false alarms? And what, what's your view on the requirement for ultrasan ultrasonic? Uh, there is there is a, quite a, a buzz on on if you pardon the pun on on the use of uh, sensors, ultrasonics. Um, what we tend to find, as I've pointed out in our presentation, is that the, the sensors we produce are built specifically to be mounted on the side of the vehicle, and where they're installed correctly. The, the issue should be minimum. Um, you know, obviously there will be some occasions, but uh, the whole point of that is to warn. Um, it is a matter of making sure that they are installed correctly and they're set up correctly as well. Fantastic. Okay, one very uh, final question. We're coming to the near the end of this. Um, I know um, when we've been talking to you, Andrew, about things like the quiet vehicle sound, there's been a lot of debate about the manual disable switch uh, and, I, and I believe for the quiet vehicle sounder that was decided that you, the driver can't turn it off. Whereas for the direct vision, uh, the driver does have a manual override so you, you can turn it off at night. Is there not a risk in your view that that might just get left off? Uh, the, this, the switches we use, uh, well, we use two types of switches, but predominantly for this we use a latch switch so that uh, you can switch it off. Uh, but the next time you turn the ignition on or turn the, and turn the ignition, turn the ignition off and turn it back on again, uh, it will re-energize the system. 
Um, alternatively, uh, if it's a real concern, um, you can put it on a timer switch so that uh, you, you press the button uh, and it'll stay off for a, uh, a small amount of time and then re-energize again. Okay, well, we've had a lot of questions. I'm really sorry if we haven't had a chance to get through to yours. Um, we are going to do our best to um, answer particular specific questions in writing uh, after this is over, if we didn't get around to answering your question uh, during the webinar. But thank you very much indeed for everyone who's uh, listened in. I hope you found it useful. I found it very, very interesting. So I'd like to thank Andrew, James, and Natalie uh, for presenting that. Behind the scenes, we've got my colleague James, who's been running the show. So thank you very much indeed. It all went very smoothly. And, uh, and thank you all for taking part. And I, I hope you found it useful. And as I said before, it's all going to be re it's all recorded and it will be available for a playback uh, from the motor transport webinar section uh, on our website. Thank you very much indeed. Have a good day. Thank you.